Welcome back my friends to the Mountain Blade 2 Starter Guide. I've actually had the game for a while now, before it was even released I was able to play the campaign and I thought, you know, the game's just released so I'll make a starter guide on what faction you should choose, which faction is like the best faction in theory and also what skills you want to be picking at the start of the game with your character's build and which skills are more important than others at the start of the game and what you should be focusing on. Just a really general starter's guide and some, you know, behind the scenes secrets that you may not have thought of yet because you haven't played the game, obviously. So let's begin. Okay, so the first choice we have is what faction culture we want to choose. Now, this is really important, but it might not be as important as you think it is because we're actually only choosing our character's cultural background. So where they were raised, this does give them a buff. So this bit's really important. However, it doesn't actually matter which background you really come from in the grand scheme of things. For example, if I'm a Sturgeon, I can still go and fight for the Empire. I can still fight for the Batanians. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, where you came from, you're still going to start the game in the same place on the campaign map, which is near the Empire. And then you can just venture off and choose whatever faction you want to join. So there's no restrictions. You can do whatever you like. So what I recommend is choosing your cultural background based on the best buff that you're going to get from choosing that background. So you have six factions to choose from in total here. I'm going to go over each one of them. Some of them are more useful than others. For example, the Vladians have a 20% more upgrade experience to troops from each battle you have. So that gives you a huge advantage in upgrading your troops a lot faster than the enemy. Whereas the Sturgeons only give you 20% less speed penalty from snow. So it lets you outmaneuver people faster, but really in the grand scheme of things, like only the northern side of the map is snow. So it's not that great really, um, compared to other factions. But for roleplay purposes, it will give you some political advantage when talking to certain clans if you grew up in the area but honestly i wouldn't base your decision on that i would base it on what the best buff is so let's start off with the batanians here forests give you 10 percent less speed penalty to your parties now this is pretty good um, because there's a lot of forest all over the map so it's always going to be an advantage in laying ambush and it also lets you outmaneuver your opponents as well. And Batanians are good at forest warfare. Their troops kind of lend themselves to that. So if you're siding with the Batanians, could be beneficial. However, there's a lot better things than 10% less speed penalty, in my opinion. So um, I'm going to skip that. The Kuzates, 10% extra speed bonus for horsemen on the campaign map. Now, if you are siding with the Kuzates, as well as having this background, this is really good because... They have so much cheap cavalry and you can really spam cavalry and have a whole cavalry force. Um, so having 10% extra movement speed to your entire army is pretty damn helpful in outmaneuvering everyone you come across and just being able to choose where the battle happens on the open plains, draw people out and whatnot. However, the AI isn't stupid, so they're not going to fight you if you know it's at a massive disadvantage to them. Uh, so do bear that in mind as well. However, that's a decent one. Next we have the Azerai. So the Azerai is one of the best ones actually. Caravans are 30% cheaper to build and you get 10% less trade penalty. So you can kind of roleplay a merchant in this game if you wish and this is a really good way of making tons of money really early in the game and you could really build up a trade empire and make you know a lot more money from your trade empire than you would if you're another faction and then with that money you can spend it on you know troops in the war effort so it's kind of like you know if you want to role play that trade aspect of the game this is really the faction to go for it's really good or at least the faction background to go for uh not not that you have to join that faction to have this bonus um, but next we have the empire one of the most popular ones according to my vote that I put out. Um, the Empire one's really good as well. 20% construction speed bonus to town projects, wall repairs and siege engines. So basically this is going to allow you to really go through the map and conquest all the areas in the late game of Mount of Blade. So when you take a castle, you'll be able to keep it repair it quickly and you know make sure you sustain the castle with those repairs and then defend it 
and then you can go off and siege other castles a lot faster than if you were playing another faction. So, you know, if you want to conquest the whole map, the Empire is a good choice for your cultural background. Next we have the Sturgeons, obviously I mentioned this earlier. 20% uh, less speed penalty from snow. In the northern regions, that's going to massively mean you can maneuver a lot faster than the enemy. Um, so yeah, really nice, but mm, there's much better choices for your cultural background in my opinion. So I wouldn't go for this. The Valadians, really good. 20% more upgrade experience to troops from battles. Now personally, I'm actually going to go for this one because it just means that even from the start of the game to the end of the game, my army is going to have more experience than anyone else's. And I can re recruit new troops and upgrade them a lot faster than 20% uh, faster than other people can. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're taking castles, going on skirmish missions, raiding villages, this is always going to be really helpful, like sort of buff to your army. So I really like this. And I also really like the background lore of the Valadians as well, uh, which I won't go into in this video. So what are the best factions? In my opinion, there are three best factions. The Valadians, the Empire, the Azerai, potentially the Kuzates, if you're really going to be taking advantage of having an entire horse-led army. However, when you're taking castles and stuff, that's not going to be as useful. So do bear that in mind, okay? Like some of these things aren't as good as some of the others. So personally, I'm going for Valadians, but if you're going for a trading style, Azerai are the best. Empire, best for conquering the whole map late game, okay? So really simple. That's what you should choose your cultural background based on though. So now let's press the next button and we can design our character. Now, obviously this is um, completely up to you. How do you design it? Uh, there's a whole plethora of design options here that you can really go to town on whenever you want to play. However, there is one really interesting thing, um, which is the height of your character. Um, because this game is quite realistic in terms of the physics system and whatnot. So if you have a small character, your hitbox is smaller. It's harder to hit you. The shields are still the same size, so it's easier to hide behind them. Um, but you also run really slowly. I noticed that. I did a little bit of testing. I found if you're shorter, you seem to run a lot slower. Because if you're higher, you have like a much bigger sort of span of your feet so you actually seem to run faster and you also have a slightly bigger reach as well so i actually think being super tall is a really good benefit yes you are a bigger target to hit but in my experience it's not that much of a problem um really so you know having your character reasonably tall is definitely going to be a big benefit and i'm six foot five in real life so i kind of appreciate being able to role play myself a little bit and also you can have a super deep voice Make a shield wall! Form a line! or you can be hilarious and have a really high pitched voice <laughs> Make a shield wall! but I, I wouldn't be able to take myself seriously like that but anyway after you've done designing your character and you have like you know loads of options if you guys haven't seen this so you can really take your time here and the oh my god the beard options guys i mean look at all the beard options here it's it's beautiful it's truly beautiful. Look at that. I can be a well-groomed Viking man. I can have Ragnar Lothbrok's hairstyle. It's, God, amazing. I love it. Character creation is fantastic. So the next thing we're going to choose is our family heritage. So depending on what you decide, this is the same for every single faction, by the way. Um, you could say, oh, they were merchants, and it's going to give you a buff to your social skills at the start of the game. Or you can say they were the Baron's retainers, um, so you get extra horsemanship and polar mobility. Um, we're going to go through all of this in a moment. But first, I want to explain to you what all of these skills actually are. So I'm going to jump into the game and we're going to talk about that. Because each one of our decisions from this point, um, as we go through our character's backstory, is going to give us, you know different buffs to our character so for example if we chose our family to be merchants they get 10 skill levels and one focus point to trade and charm attributes plus one point in intelligence but obviously you don't know what that means yet so we're going to jump into the game and i'll explain all of this stuff and then we'll come back now before we go any further with our character development i think it would be useful to you guys to explain exactly how your character's skill tree works in this game and what's important what's not really important so let's start by talking about our attributes. As you can see, 
The attributes are vigor, control, endurance, and so on on the left here. You only get one attribute point every three levels, however, so you're going to want to spend that wisely, and it's a lot harder to level up your attributes. So it's really important that you get these right at the start of the game. This is just an example, by the way. But um, this is Vigor starting out. If you have a higher Vigor skill, it makes it a lot easier to learn the melee skills like one-handed, two-handed and polearm a lot faster. So if you want to specialize in melee combat or at least have some melee combat ability, this is really important. And I do recommend you have some because even going to the arena and taking part in those aspects of the game is actually really important. So even if you want to use a bow, this is still useful. And each one of these skills has its own tree, which we'll talk more about how this works in a moment. But first, let's go over our attributes. So the next one down is control. This is going to govern our ability with throwing weapons and bows. So basically ranged combat. Bows, crossbows, throwing, really useful. Obviously, if you don't want to do that, you can also ignore it. However, my character is going to specialize in this. This will also make you more accurate at archery. Of course, you can train the skill itself, but if you have a low, a low control, then it's going to affect your ability to fire arrows as well. So it's worth having both of them high if you want to specialize in that. Next, we have endurance. This governs the skill of riding, athletics, and smithing really important for any combat situation both riding and athletics so another very useful skill to have on your character and also your health as well next we have cunning cunning is the ability to predict what other people will do and outwit their plans the skills that are bound to cunning attributes are scouting so scouting is basically your ability to see what's happening around you on the map let me just quickly demonstrate this for you so as you can see, my scouting ability is quite low. So if I look around me, I can't currently see anyone. But if I like move around a bit, look, now I can see, oh look, there's a giant army over there. Or I might see there's some enemy bandits over here if I have a high scouting skill. I'll also be able to see their tracks even after they've left. So I can see which way the enemies are heading and I can track them down and kill them um, without, you know, because I have that scouting ability. It also gives you some other advantages as well, but that's the main thing. The next one we have here is Tactics. As you can see, Tactics gives you a judgment of how troops will perform in combat. This allows you to make a good prediction of when an unorthodox tactic will work and when it won't work. And if you look at the buffs it's giving you here, Cavalry attacks cause 10% more morale loss. So if you charge the enemy with Cavalry, they lose the morale even more rapidly. This is really good actually, really strong, because a lot of battles can be won by reducing the enemy's morale rapidly instead of just killing them all. So, you know, I'm not going to go over every perk in this tree, but it could be worth you looking them up yourself if you want to specialize in a certain thing. But my recommendation at the start would be just to sort of play the game and see what works for you. Um, and don't obsess too much over your first build. The next thing we have in here is roguery. Now, roguery is basically just talking about um, you raiding other villagers, um, attacking other people and getting more money for it. So it's quite a fun sort of roleplay element if you want to play like an evil bandit character, which is very much doable in this game. Next, we have social. Social is the ability to understand people's motivations and sway them. The skills are bound to social attributes are charm, leadership, and trade. Now, trade is super important for making money, obviously. Uh, everything you sell um, can have an increasing amount, meaning that, you know, all the money you get from looting people and whatnot can be sold for a lot more. And it even helps you build up a caravan business and make more money from that, you know, building up your trade empire. Next, we have leadership, which again governs kind of like your defensive morale of your troops. And it also gives you more defensive bonuses when defending your own land. So, for example, town garrison is 20% more effective for security. The town has a 20% higher loyalty gain. So, really useful for kind of like building up your empire and making sure you maintain it. Next, we have charm. Now, this is more of a sort of social aspect of the game because you meet a lot of NPCs face to face and talk to them. And also can talk your way out of a few situations as well. So, as you can see... Personal, when introducing yourself to lords for the first time, you have a 10% chance to gain plus two relationship with them, which is really useful because it's quite hard to gain a relationship with lords at the start. 
or gain plus 10 more influence by winning tournaments. I mean, this kind of like boosts your renown faster. However, it's not necessary. You can just sort of grind it out anyway. Like 20% more renown from battles is obviously going to make you become famous faster, but you don't need it. So it's kind of less important in that sense. Next, let's talk about intelligence. Intelligence represents aptitude for reading, theoretical learning, and the skills that are bound to intelligence and tributes are the steward, medicine, and engineering. So firstly, steward. This actually is all about kind of managing your town and, and making your settlements prosper. So food consumption is reduced by 20%, 10 plus party size for every vassal, enhanced mines, 50% more tax income from mines and so on. So you can kind of make a build around owning a settlement and making more money from it. I kind of prefer trade myself, but hey, that's just me. This is like AFK income. Next we have medicine. So medicine is really useful because it just helps your character heal faster, even if you're playing solo. So self-medication increases your character healing rate by 10%. Just makes you play the game faster, really, and there's a lot of situations this is super useful. You can also increase your character's hit points as well. Um, and there's lots of buffs to increasing your party's healing abilities. However, you also get people uh, like followers in the game that can give you good medicine um, skills if you carry them in your party so there's kind of like a certain hero party class that you can have with you but I'm not going to spoil that because it's kind of like god build and we can get into that in another video next we have engineering personally I don't care about engineering but you can construct and build castle walls um, faster catapults are 30% more effective you can build fire versions of siege engines and you know you just get advantage in waging war on castles effectively with engineering and also castle defenses as well and building them faster so it's very useful so now we've kind of gone over these skills let's talk about this leveling tree what's this green thing what's the gray bar how does that work all the skills in Mountain Blade Bannerlord 2 are learnt by using them. So it's kind of like a Skyrim system, basically. The more you use your skill, the better you get at it. However, there are a few things we can do to improve how quickly we learn an ability. For example, in my one-handed skill tree, I'm currently level 11 one-handed skill. If I use my one-handed skill more often, it will level up. However, if I want it to level up faster, I need to apply something called focus points. So you get focus points each time you level up and you're training your abilities basically. So if I add one focus point to that, you'll see this area becomes green. So now I have like a learning limit. So that's I'm gonna improve my skill faster when I'm training my one-handed skill now. So basically you're going to want to focus on certain skills at the start of the game, namely combat skills and riding skills. Um, so you're always going to want to have a green area in these skills so that when you use them, you improve them more rapidly. And as you can see just here at the top, you get one focus point every time you level up. So if you want to only use one-handed skills, then put all of your focus points into the one-handed skill tree and just focus on using one-handed skills to kill bandits and whatnot to level up that ability faster. What you'll then notice is um, you can unlock perks so here we have so here we have the marksman perk we can click on that accuracy with bows increased by 10 percent so we can get that and it just learns the perk so now we do more damage with bows however um, if you look at some of the other skill trees as you progress you unlock multiple perks so you actually have to make a choice here we have a choice depending on how we want to build our character basically you can either pick the appraiser or appraiser which give you a five percent increase to selling equipment or we have wholesaler which give us a five percent increase to selling trade goods so if you want to be like a trader and run from one side of the country to the other selling furs and make five percent more money then you're probably going to be making a lot more money with wholesaler however if you're the kind of person who just likes to you know raid villagers kill bandits and whatnot and then sell their goods you'll get a lot more use out of them. So with this concept in mind on how these skills work, now let's go over designing our character. Okay, so now we're back to our first decision on where our family is from. And with our understanding of what we know, we can now make a, you know, educated decision about what we want. Personally, I recommend having your character have a backstory of being very good at combat 
because it just really helps you with everything you do in personal gameplay. You can roleplay a merchant and fully go for that if you like. That's absolutely fine. However, I just have a lot more fun with the combat aspect of the game, so I recommend specializing in the combat ability. However, there's like kind of a most efficient build, shall we say, in what you can choose. For example, if you really want to use a crossbow and you really want to be a rogue and um, rob villagers and whatnot, um, mercenaries is a really good faction for that. Um, so kind of make make a plan about one melee skill you want to focus on and one range skill you want to focus on, if at all. You're also going to want to have some kind of riding capability that's quite important. But everything else is kind of up to you for flavor and how you want to play the game. And I've already described everything to you. But just have that in your head when you go through this. So I think our parents' backstory of a Baron's Retainers is really good for my combat character because... Pole arms give you a lot of damage on horseback and it also gives you a riding capability as well. Most of your gameplay is going to take part on horseback. So I recommend kind of focusing on these two things as a melee skill to start off with. However, if you want to specialize in the arena, one-handed is very good as well. Um, but, you know, we're going to make full use of both of these skills. So let's use that to start off with. Next, as a child, you were noted for, and then you can choose what your child's backstory was. I think your skill with horses is really good because it gives you plus one to your medicine and plus one to your riding skill. Another very good one for combat is your attention to detail. This gives you one-handed skill and also athletics. Athletics is really good in the arena and so is one-handed skill. And the arena is just so much fun because it's literally just like uh, you versus the AI and you can just do it repeatedly and earn a little bit of gold and i think my skill with horses will probably be more beneficial at the start of the game we can train up our one-handed skill later do remember that if you just keep carry on using your skills you know you'll train them up very quickly but at the start you kind of want to specialize in something specific so next during our adolescence we're going to choose what we were doing we can say that we we're helping with trade we were hunting small game which gives us archery boost and it also gives us some tactics as well which is very useful for late game for sure and by the way when you are doing this just think carefully because for example if i say that i herded the sheep i get plus one to throwing and plus one to athletics now in my opinion athletics is really good but i'm already planning on using a bow for ranged so throwing ability is a complete waste to me so i don't want to do that same with um repairing this village smithy yes i get extra two-handed skill but I don't want to do any blacksmithing at all. I just want to loot my enemies for their weapons. So I don't want to waste any abilities in this. So you want to be really efficient, you know, when you're choosing these decisions. So I'm going to say that I hunted small game because it gives me plus one archery and also plus one tactics, which is just infinitely useful later on in the game when I start employing my army and whatnot. Uh, next choice. This is what we did in our youth. My two most favorite options here are going to be trained with the cavalry, which gives us another one to our pole arm ability and horse riding skill, or rode with the scouts, which gives us another archery skill and another riding skill. So I'm going to say that I actually rode with the scouts because I'm going to be focusing on archery early game. And there's some really good tactics you can use to farm experience from the enemy. So I recommend, you know, if you're interested, follow my build and my playthrough. Um, I'll link the playthrough in the description below if you guys want to follow on with this playthrough. And I'll be giving you loads of tips throughout it. Before you set out on life adventuring, your biggest achievement was you defeated an enemy in battle, which gives us two-handed and one-handed skill. Now, in my opinion, this is kind of pointless as well because... I only want to specialize in one of these. I don't want to use both of them. In my opinion, successfully leading a manhunt is pretty damn good because it gives you tactics and also leadership. Leadership is always going to be good for your party. Next, we have kind of like our, we start to get into the story. So we have our final backstory about um, how you drove off some bandits that attacked your family. Um, you rode off on a fast horse. We'll really maximize our riding capability. Um, you drove them off with arrows. Personally, I'm going to go for this because, you know, wow, now my archery skill is going to be insanely good. You can also say you subdued the raider. Then we get one-handed and athletics, which is a really nice balance to have. So this is effectively our build. As you can see, it also tells you what our attributes are going to be as well. And I'll load into the game and I'll show you the screen in a moment. But I just want to quickly mention 
um, you can see I've specialized in one main combat ability, which is archery, because I really enjoy that. Um, I've also got some competence in pole arms because you do run out of arrows um, in some fights. So you want to be able to take people out with another weapon. So I am somewhat competent in learning pole arms reasonably quickly, but I can invest in my vigor attribute later. Um, so you're not like tied to this forever, okay? Next we have endurance. I've also, you know, I need one skill to get around, which is either athletics or horseback. My character specializes as a horseman. Um, a horseback archer so that's what we're going for there you know i recommend going cunning social uh, one of these and having some kind of competence in it um, you can you know invest everything and have a super high control attribute and whatnot but you don't need it at all so in my opinion don't waste um skill points in things you're not going to use that would be my advice uh, okay so now let's press next and get started Okay, so based on our choices, this is what our character looks like at the very start of the game. As you can see, he's already very good with a bow. We can already get the Marksman perk here, um, and that's going to increase our ability with a bow and damage by accuracy by 10%. Um, and we are already on our way to unlocking all of these things, and this green area is going to mean we're going to rapidly improve um, with this skill. And as we level up, we can add more focus points so we can improve even faster. Um, the next thing is obviously our riding skill. So we can already buy the riding perk to increase our horse's hit points by plus 6%. Um, and as you can see, yeah, we're going to level up pretty quickly with doing what we're already doing, which is what you want at the start of the game. So as you can see, that's already given us a boost at the start of the game and we're really not far from our next level where we'll get another focus point to invest in our character and another three levels later we'll get another attribute and we can choose on what we want to focus on next. What you'll notice as well is currently we have a control skill of four. If I am level three and I put another attribute point into to make this five, we'll have another two blank sort of another one of these blank focus point slots because every time you use a focus point you fill one of these slots and this green area goes up a bit more which means you can quickly learn that green area so if you have a higher control skill combined with focus points you will have more points to invest so you won't just fill this out and then you'll start leveling up slowly you can like continue to level up quickly basically if that makes sense i know it's quite complicated to kind of explain but guys i hope you found this video helpful if you did please do give it a like because it really does help out me and the channel and uh, if you want to continue watching my playthrough of mountain blade i would really appreciate it i'll link it down below um, i'm also going to be giving out loads of tips as i play through the game and having fun as well um, but also I'll be doing some other guides separately uh, which I'll link down below in the description or of course you can just subscribe for it if you're that interested. Also press the bell icon um, so you get notified about those and then just come to the channel and double check that those videos are released because sometimes YouTube doesn't notify people. But yeah guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this helps you out on your Mountain Blade journey. I will see you in the next video. Have a great time playing this game, guys. It's absolutely amazing.